that we have not forgotten when Jesus uh, offered us the opportunity, the privilege and the blessing of coming to his table. He says, do this in remembrance of me. Do this in remembrance of me. Our service today is about uh, the elements that we see uh, laid out before us on the table. Elements that represent Jesus and his sacrifice on the cross. Both his body broken in the form of the uh, bread and also his blood shed for the forgiveness of sins uh, through the cup that we will observe together as those uh, who know Jesus Christ as our Savior uh, in just a little bit. I'm going to uh, be looking at uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 17 in just a moment. Just to remind you, you know, Jesus said that the supper should mean something to us. It should mean something to you. That this is, uh, while coming into worship is always very important, it's always special, and it's always supposed to uh, garner our uh, special attention, that we are to uh, do our very best to set aside the distractions, the thoughts, and the things on our minds, and the, uh, even just not to be too absorbed in the, the various things that are going on around us, uh, but to focus on God and really visualize ourselves coming into His presence to worship Him. Because God desires our worship. He set us free that we might worship Him. We, he brought us uh, into a saving relationship that we could say uh, worship Him. And the supper is also a very special time which we observe because it is a command that Jesus gave us. Uh, the two ordinances, the, the two commands that Jesus gave us specifically to observe were baptism and the Lord's Supper. And so when we come before Him uh, in this way, it should mean something. Do this in remembrance of of me carries with it, for me at least, more than just a casual nod to something that happened in the past, but to say it with our lives uh, and, and to say it in our praise, I have not forgotten that this means something to us. It could even be a call to renew our commitment uh, to Jesus, uh, to walking with Him and to growing in Him and representing Jesus in, in greater ways, to remember, to recall our complete dependence on Him. One of the things that we as human beings are so easily tempted with, something that our flesh just uh, seems to naturally do, is, is to act as though we're independent, though we can just get by on our own, our own strength or our own merit, and uh, the supper reminds us that is not the case. But Jesus gave us everything that we need uh, at the cross. The Corinthians struggled with this. And as Paul writes to the Corinthians, you know that that was a church that was in disarray. It was a church that had difficulties and divisions. And they, they had a hard time getting it right. And I'm not exactly sure all of the different reasons that Corinth had a struggle. But I do know a few of them. Some of them were just the fact that they were a very different group of people, or there were uh, folks from all different kinds of walks of life, Jew and Gentile, and, and folks who have been recently saved, people who have been saved for a long time, and they're all kind of thrown together into groups. Some were rich, some were poor, some were in between, uh, some had traveled the world, some had never been out of town, uh, some had uh, a very pagan backgrounds, others had a, a very religious uh, or, or uh, Jewish background, all thrown together. And then expected to figure it all out together in, in a very short period of time. And, and so Paul writes to them and he says, listen, you know, there, there's some problems, there's some issues that he wants to address. And some of those problems had to do with the way they observed their worship services. And it starts in chapter 11, verse 17. And, and uh, the chief among them is their uh, observance of the Lord's Supper. He says, listen, you know, this is something you need to do, but it's important about how you do it as well. And, and that it, it should mean something to you. He says uh, earlier in the uh, book of 1 Corinthians, he says, you know what? You guys got some growing to do. I can't even call you, I'm uh, sure I call you infants or, or babes in Christ, chapter 3, verse 1. They're not lost people. They were people enriched in Christ with the testimony of Christ confirmed in them from chapter 1. We looked at that last Wednesday night. And he's not trying to tear them down. He's trying to build them up. And he's saying, listen, when you come before the supper, there's something here that's important. What you do before you observe the supper, what, what you're doing while you observe the supper, and even how you live after the observing of the supper, it, it, it makes a difference. So let's look at, at what Paul says 
And if you found uh, 1 Corinthians 11, verse 17, and if you're able to, you stand and honor the reading of God's words. He says, in the following directives, I have no praise for you, for your means do more harm than good. In the first place, I hear that when you come together as a church, there are divisions among you, and to some extent, I believe it. No doubt, there have to be differences among you to show which of you have God's approval. When you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper you eat. For as you eat, each one of you goes ahead without waiting for anybody else. Uh, one remains hungry, another gets drunk. Don't you have homes to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you for this? Certainly not. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus on the night he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. A man ought to examine himself before he eats of the bread and drinks of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without recognizing the body of the Lord eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many among you are weak and sick, and a number of you have fallen asleep. But if we judged ourselves, we would not come under judgment. When we are judged by the Lord, we are being disciplined so that we will not be condemned with the world. So then, my brothers, when you come together to eat, wait for each other. If anyone is hungry, he should eat at home, so that when you meet together, it may not result in judgment. And when I come, I will give you further directions. Lord, thank you for your word. And as we come before this table that you have prepared for us, what you did at Calvary, and what these symbols represent, I pray, God, that we would indeed look at our hearts and prepare ourselves that we would recognize what these elements stand for and that we would live um, as those drawn more closely to you, as those who desire you more, as those who love you more, and those who will be willing to serve you even more in the days to come. Thank you. Hide me behind the cross as we share this word today and let only your words be heard. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Very familiar passage, especially the uh, words that uh, Paul gave us as he said that he received from the Lord that we uh, repeat every time that we observe the supper. But uh, he's talking about those who are invited to observe the supper as an expression of love for Christ and each other uh, and a commitment to obey and follow Jesus. And he says there's something that needs to happen before we do this. And, and really, it's also telling us some things that uh, we ought to be recognizing while we observe the supper, or as we observe uh, the supper. But there's also something that should be different uh, or recognizable about us uh, after we observe the supper. So before, during, and after. Before, we should examine ourselves before the bread and the cup. He says, listen, we, uh, a man, uh, verse 20, ought to examine himself before he eats the bread and drinks the cup. Uh, ought to do this before. Examining ourselves for what? What is it that we're looking for? What is he talking about here? Well, if we look at the context of the passage, again, Corinth had some issues. This particular church had a lot of division, a lot of divisiveness. They weren't exactly in agreement on who they were following. Some thought Paul ought to be followed. Some said, well, you know what? This guy, Peter, he's pretty uh, special too. Others would say, hey, listen, I'm, I'm above all of you. I'm going to follow Christ. And, and yet they were all trying to do the same thing, but they couldn't get together and do that. They were immature. They were fighting over some of the different things that uh, 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 between Jew and Gentile and so forth. All those issues all boiled to the surface because of their immaturity, and they needed to be looking for ways where they could grow in their faith and where they could be more mature as followers of Christ. And, and so really those things apply to us as well. 
uh, to walk closer with Jesus? What, what needs to take place? Well, we examine our hearts, and one of the things that we're looking for, I'm just going to call over sin. Things that are, are clear and obvious in our lives that have crept in, snuck in, <laughs> taken over, that we've slipped into, uh, that we're walking, and that we really just need to say, you know what, enough of that, no more, I'm going to uh, continue to turn away from that and turn to Christ and walk with Him. And uh, we could talk about a lot of different things, kind of try to summarize just a couple here for us that we can look at. The first one that always comes to my mind is pride. We should be looking at our hearts for evidence of pride, because pride is... To use a mathematic term, the common denominator for so many things. How many different things that we fall into or sins that we get involved in because of pride? Because we, we think that we can do it on our own. We think that we can do it on our own strength. We think that we can live in a certain way and get by with it. Or whatever the case is. Or that we're entitled to things that we're really not entitled to. Whatever. It all kind of boils down to pride. Pride's the, the basic sin. Pride was the sin that Adam and Eve struggled with. Pride is the thing that uh, the Bible says God hates because it really sets us up against Him. And, and pride just manifests itself in so many different ways in our lives. That if we would just really take an honest look at our hearts and say, you know what, Lord, show me what's in my heart. Show me where there might be some pride and things that I need to die to. Because pride uh, pops up in all different kinds of ways. Sometimes people just think, uh, you know, they're just the greatest thing and, and the most wonderful and whatever, and, and, you know, they're just better than everybody else. But pride can also show up in other ways. Um, here in uh, Corinth, uh, and, and he refers to this, too, about humiliating those who have nothing. There, there's a, uh, a, a sharp contrast between those of wealth and those who are poor. And, you know, rich people can be pride, prideful, but so can poor people. They can be prideful, too, and, and they can react... And, We've got to look at all of our hearts and see if there is pride there that sets us up one against another. And to replace that with God's humility or let Him replace that in us and the fruit of the Spirit to show up more uh, than our, our pride as we die to ourselves. Uh, there are other things too. He talks about divisions or lack of unities. You know, we need to look at those things very carefully and, and what causes those and, and, and are we working uh, to cooperate with the Holy Spirit for unity within the body. Or um, areas of compromise as well. I was reading a, a quote by uh, C.S. Lewis, and, and I realized it's just a man. And, uh, but some of the things that he had to say, some of his observations, this really uh, caused me to stop and think. And he said, you know what? Uh, God is very forgiving. He's very patient with us as we try to live for him, even if we're falling on our face. You know, we get up every day and say, Lord, I'm going to live for you. I'm going to try to do for you. And, and, and we don't do so good, but the next day we're up trying again, and we're trying again, trying again. But one of the things uh, C.S. Lewis said that God isn't, uh, doesn't make provision for is a determined compromise. Where we say, Lord, I'll give you this part, but not that part. <laughs> He's not patient with that, I'll not give you this part thing. He's patient with us as we try to give him all of our lives, even though we stumble and fail uh, so frequently. But he's not so patient with that compromise, that determined compromise. And really, as human beings, we find ways of excusing and setting aside parts of our lives. Then we say, well, I'm going to hold on to this, Lord. You can't have that part of my life, or I'm going to do it the way I want to do it, which may be related back to pride again, uh, but that compromise. And he's just saying, you know what, we need to examine ourselves. We need to examine our motives. We need to examine, are we just trying to put on a show for somebody else, or are we coming to worship the Lord? And that may be the most important thing for the church today, in the 21st century, in North America to hear. Are we coming before the Lord of the ages, the Lord God Almighty, the Creator of heaven and earth, the God who is described as King of kings and Lord of lords? The God who died on Calvary and rose again. Are we coming to worship Him? Or are we coming for some other reason? A man ought to examine himself. And Jesus, know this, Jesus will help you to overcome what hinders you. He desires to heal your heart. He desires to help you to live for Him more and more every day. He desires to help you to turn from the past and the sin and, and all the self and, and the pride and all that and to live for Him, to embrace Him and to desire Him more and to experience Him more. He desires to help you in those things.
There's an old hymn. We don't sing it anymore. It's pretty much been lost. I don't see it in, in uh, hymnals from about 1970 onwards. Uh, a hymn that says, there is a, it's quote an Old Testament scripture, there is a balm, B-A-L-M, in Gilead. There's a balm in Gilead to make the wounded whole. There is a balm in Gilead to heal the sin-sick soul. The balm in Gilead is a reference to Jesus Christ and what he does for us. And that when we come to worship him and we come and we bow down humbly before him and say, Lord, you know, what? I see some stuff in my life that I don't like, that I don't want, and that I know that you don't like, and that isn't best for me, and it is according to your plan and purpose for my life. And I want to set them aside. He is more than willing to come in and heal those wounded and those sinful places in our life if we turn them over to him. So when he says we ought to examine our lives, it's about turning that part of our life over to him and following him and making sure the reason that we come to the table, that our motive is our love for Jesus Christ. And it'll show up in how we treat others, as, as Paul says here, we're not going to abuse the poor or um, uh, take advantage as the rich. So before we observe the Lord's Supper, to examine ourselves, to know that we know Jesus Christ because the table is prepared and is available to everyone who knows Jesus Christ as Savior. If we don't know Jesus, then it's time to say, look, we don't know what kind of time we've got left and we have this great Savior. We have this great offer of salvation. We need to accept and receive that now, first, before coming to the table. Because of what it represents. It's a great witness. We proclaim the Lord's death. What it means. That we need a Savior, but the Savior is provided. He is Jesus Christ and received. And that has to happen before we come to the table. Well, what about as we observe the Lord's Supper? I just put it down uh, like this. During the Supper, we understand the purpose of the bread and the cup. You know? They are elements, but they're symbols. They represent something. The Bread that represents the very body of Jesus Christ broken for us. We're broken. He was perfect and sinless. We're broken and sinful. That He became sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God. That He did at the cross what we needed to have happen. That we need a Savior, but a Savior is provided. And of course the cup represents His blood which was shed for us. There is no forgiveness there is no remission of sin apart from the shedding of blood. So if we focus on this, the reason that Jesus' body was broken is because we're spiritually broken beyond repair as human beings. Our natural self is broken. There's nothing that we can do or anybody else can do uh, for us except for Jesus. We've broken the commandments. You know, the Ten Commandments, just those uh, uh, laws of God, we have broken them. And if we're honest with ourselves, we've broken all of them at one time or another. People used to go around saying, well, I haven't actually committed the act. But Jesus said, listen, I tell you, you've heard it said, but I tell you. You know, even those thoughts, even those intentions of the heart make us guilty of breaking those commandments. And the Bible says that we've broken one, we've broken them all. We're guilty. And we can't undo that. You know, it's like the old illustration of the toothpaste and the toothpaste tube. When you squirt it out of the tube, it's really hard to get back in. And that's the way it is. We've broken the commands. We can't undo that. The law is weakened by the flesh, and we could never be able to be perfect. Our very, very best efforts fall well short. Isaiah said, our good works, our own self-righteousness, is like filthy rags in God's sight. It's just repulsive to Him. Our own efforts to earn our way to Him are repulsive to Him. And all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Every one of us. But Jesus paid the penalty. He paid the price. He paid it in full. Our brokenness, our illnesses, the certainty of death, all of these things prove that we are under judgment for our sin. And we understand that the wages of sin is death. Not only physical death, but spiritual death. The second death, separation from God for eternity. But the free gift of God, a gift that can be received by any who would turn to Him, who would turn from their sin itself and receive Him, the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. Because the Bible says 
Surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows. Yet we considered him stricken uh, by God. That is, at first we didn't see anything special in Jesus or realize our intense need for him. Uh, that uh, he died for us. He demonstrated his love for us. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Uh, he, his body was pierced for our uh, transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. And by his wounds, we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us have turned to his own way. And, and we're still tempted to do that. But the Lord has laid on him the iniquity, that, that is the sin of us all. And he offered his body as a guilt offering to do God's will. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree so that we might die to sin and live for righteousness. By his wounds we have been healed. That's why his body was broken for you. Because we were broken beyond repair. And there's only one way to make that right. And it's do what he did at the cross. The reason that Jesus shed his blood. Uh, no other payment for sins could ever work. There is no forgiveness without the shedding of blood. Animals in the Old Testament sacrificial system. Were a temporary stand in for us. That they could never uh, do permanently. But it did help people to understand the gravity of our sin. And the continual sacrifice, day in, day out, helped realize how important all of this was. But Jesus made the final once for all sacrifice. His perfect bloodshed covers all the sin of the world and takes away our sin. Because he never sinned. Because, more importantly, he accomplished what was right. And because he fully depended on the Lord. And his sacrifice was necessary for us. But it was also sufficient for us. And so when we observe the supper. And we see these elements. The bread and the cup. We see in them symbols that represent something very real. And that is what Jesus did at Calvary for us. That we need. But is freely given to us. to receive before the supper, we examine ourselves and we make sure we're coming with the right motive. And during the supper, we remember what these symbols mean. We don't take it lightly. We do this in remembrance of Him. A very solemn uh, and yet celebratory time. We are grateful for what God did for us. Well, after the supper, what would happen if we live as those who belong to the Lord? as the bread and the cup symbolize. What would happen if we live life we really belong to Him and that He was the center of our lives and that He was the greatest part of our lives and that He was number one in every area of our life? What if we live life, all of life, in a way worthy of the Lamb that was slain and took up His life again? With hearts that are right uh, before God, a life that is cleansed before God, that we've confessed our sins uh, and that we have been uh, uh, washed clean and, and cleansed by Him. What would be different about us? If we lived as though He was worthy of our best, and we lived our life as an offering of ourselves, that we put ourselves on the altar as a living sacrifice to Him, what would be different? What would that be like? The joy and the spiritual power and the, the, the fanning of the flames in our lives again, what would that be like? Because we never outgrow our dependence on God. What would it be like if we were changed, if, if we dedicated ourselves anew and afresh, if we committed our lives, renewed our commitment to Him in this way? To remember that all of our lives are dependent on Him. It is the way to be renewed, is to remember our dependence. There is a man, I'm just going to simply call him Connor. And Connor says this, as a young adult... He had asked for God's help in his life. He had bowed his knee, and with all the sincerity that he could uh, genuinely muster, he said, Lord, I really want you to help me. Help me to find the right person to marry, the right career to go into, the right way to live out my life before you. And, and uh, God honored that prayer, and he was blessed with home and family and, 
uh, another generation that followed him is blessed with a business and success, and, and he uh, was blessed with reaching a lot of people. But over the decades, he became more dependent, or independent, rather. He began to allow this kind of thinking to slip into his life. Well, you know, look at what I've done, and, and look at what I have, and, and, and look what I can do. And suddenly that started to crumble and God allowed some things to come against that and some reverses to happen. And he said, you know, one day I woke up and realized how far off track I'd gotten. He got back down on his knees. He said, Lord, I need to renew my commitment to you. He says this, uh, success uh, that brought independence, this I can do this on my own kind of thinking came into my life. Uh, but he learned that dependence on the Lord is constant. Um, and, and he went on to say that as we grow, by always being desperate for God, even in our times of abundance. Okay. <laughs> that may be one of the hardest lessons to learn. It may be why God allows difficulties and obstacles and crises to come into our lives. Because what typically happens, what I see in my own life is, is that things are going well, you just kind of sort of drift into this independent, I can do it, I've got this, I can handle this, until a crisis comes and they're like, oh Lord, need your help here, oh God, need, and we start to get back on our knees and draw closer to Him, as though we're only dependent on Him when trouble happens. We need to be so desperate for Him that we're dependent on Him at all times. I remember uh, the very first time was in a small airplane. Uh, I was with uh, my seventh and eighth grade uh, math and science teacher, Jim Gale, a wonderful teacher. And uh, after school one day, he took uh, three of us, uh, three of his students up for a little flight out of the airport in Ashland. We're tooling along, and uh, different you know times, everyone got to sit in the, the front seat and take the uh, the yoke. A little steering wheel in our hands, you know? And he's saying, well, you know, try and keep the nose level and how you do a turn and kind of pull back, you know, keep the nose so you're not descending or climbing or such. And it's like, I'm doing pretty good. I got this, you know? How foolish and how ignorant it would have been to say, oh, I I've got this. You, you don't need to help me anymore. That was the first time I ever hold on to the wheel. And plus, there were other things like the throttle and rubber pedals. I hadn't even been introduced to them yet, you know? All that other stuff that goes along with it. <clears throat> But how similar that is to us in life, you know? We, we think we can hold it straight and level, so we, we've got it. And we just say, Lord, I've got this. I can handle this. He's like, oh, you don't even understand what you're talking about. There's so much more. You need to be dependent on the instructor. You need to be dependent on the teacher, on the master, and let him teach you what you need to do. And so it is with God. We never, Connor continues, we never really outgrow our dependence on him. The very attitude that put us in a position to receive his blessings are the attitudes that keep us in that position. Do we want God to continue to lift us up? I do. How about you? Then we need to approach him with a humble attitude. Never forget our absolute need to depend on him. When we come to the table, I think that when we do this in remembrance of him, we've prepared our heart. To come forward with the right motive and the right attitude. And we recognize what these symbols represent. We're driven to that realization that we're dependent on God for everything. And if we are more desperate for God when we leave this place. More desperate to live for Him. More desperate to love Him and experience Him and, and do what He's called us to do. That there will be a change in us. A renewed commitment. The kind of thing that Paul was encouraging us to have. So as we come to our invitation time, the first and most obvious invitation is, if we need to receive the Lord as our Savior, this is the time. Today is the day of salvation. To come and to receive personally the free gift that He died to give us that these uh, symbols represent. What He did at the cross. To receive that in our heart. Believe that. Accept it. And say, God, I'm going to turn away from my sin and self, turn to Christ and trust Him only, and live for Him only the rest of my life. And as believers, you see, you know what, Lord, I, I want to recognize how dependent I am on You and be more desperate for You when I leave this place today. Lord, thank You for Your Word. I praise You for it.
And I pray that in this time that we've had to look at your word, that you have spoken to us. That you have reminded us to search our hearts. And we give the Holy Spirit permission to search our hearts and see if there be any wicked way in us. That we can confess it and turn from it and receive your mercy and your goodness to fill those broken places. That we are confessing that we're aware of what these symbols represent and how important they are for us. And I pray, God, also that we would recognize how dependent we are on you. This great myth that we all buy into from time to time, at least a little bit, that we have this and we can do it on our own. We need you. Help us to be more desperate for you and to enjoy you and your presence, your joy, all that much more as we walk more closely with you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> Our hymn of invitation this morning is number 591, Have Thine Own Way, Lord, a, a hymn of <coughs> surrender and commitment to him. And you know what? It's, what matters more is what you want. As we stand together, number 591, if God has spoken to your heart today, this invitation time is for you. Won't you respond to him? Won't you respond to the word that we've heard this morning? Thank you.